Hello and welcome to Unit 13 of the Technology, Innovation, and the Civil War course. I'm Dr. Nick Sandblock. Uh, this unit we're looking at mobilizing the South for Union, the U.S. Colored Troops. When the Civil War began, most Northerners believed that the rebellion was essentially a plot by the 46,200 plantation owners and not a movement that enjoyed genuine support from the other roughly uh, 6 million non-enslaved peoples in the southern states. A few early experiences, such as the welcome that Union forces got in what is now uh, West Virginia, what was then the western, northwestern portion of uh, the larger state of Virginia, after the Battle of Rich Mountain, encouraged this belief. There were a lot of Unionists and very few slaveholders uh, in what is now West Virginia. As the Union slowly advanced deeper into the South, it attempted to stand up formations of Southern troops fighting for the United States, fighting for Union. Today's reading deals with this phenomenon and explains its mixed success. There was one group, though, that was untapped uh, essentially for the first half of the war and yet was uh, phenomenally interested in transforming the Union into a country that rejected slavery. These, um, of course, are going to be the, uh, the pool from which the U.S. colored troops uh, draw manpower. There weren't many African Americans in the northern states, but they vocally urged uh, President Lincoln to approve the establishment of new units, new army units, that would open a chance for um, black soldiers to fight for emancipation. From Lincoln's perspective, uh, there were problems with this, however, uh, especially early in the war. One was that emancipation was not yet uh, the unions, among the Union's war aims. Northerners were fighting for the preservation of the country, not for its transformation. As the Confederacy uh, defeated the Union's first attempts to win the war, and as the casualty figures mounted, Lincoln saw an opportunity to um, expand the war aim to uh, including prominently the defeat of slavery. Something had to be done in order to keep the, the momentum of the war effort going. Uh, preservation of the Union was not in itself alone able to sustain a continued war effort as the war continued to become uh, very bloody, very expensive, um, very degrading of the country's uh, resources, uh, physical and emotional resources, uh, including human beings. Um, now, this uh, new added objective of ending slavery did not necessarily mean that enslaved people would reside in the United States in a sort of post-war uh, vision. Most people even amongst abolitionists of the 19th century, most people doubted that a racially uh, pluralist society was even possible, let alone preferable. And early abolitionists tried uh, in the antebellum era, before the war, to buy the freedom of slaves and ship freedmen to uh, a colony in Africa called Liberia. Liberia declared itself an independent republic in 1848, which was a, a very tumultuous year. Of course, we see the Mexican-American War going on in North America. We also see a lot of pro-democracy movements uh, cropping up in Europe uh, before being squelched. Remember Franz Siegel and his uh, uh, endeavors on the behalf of uh, Germans, who then became German-Americans, as democratic initiatives in Europe were, were crushed in 1848. This is the same year that Liberia declared itself an independent republic. But the uh, sectionally divided United States Congress did not yet uh, extend recognition 
to that country. On June 5, 1862, Lincoln officially recognized both Liberia and the former French colony of Haiti, which had overthrown local slaveholding rulers in 1803, some uh, 59 years earlier. At first, the exact implications of Lincoln's actions were still uh, somewhat unclear. When he drafted an emancipation document the following month, in July, he did it secretly. Uh, the, remember, the war was not going well. The war was actually going quite badly for the Union. And Lincoln wanted to wait to release this uh, emancipation document um, to follow a success, rather than to allow a policy shift to um, appear in a moment when the war is going badly and it would be interpreted uh, both domestically and on the international stage as a, as, as a desperate act. The Battle of Antietam in September of 1862 was a frustrating, bloody draw. In fact, still remains the bloodiest day in United States history is uh, uh, the fighting of the, of the Battle of Antietam. But it was uh, close enough to a victory to allow Lincoln to, to see an opportunity and seize it, uh, announcing his Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation, however, um, was framed uh, in, in a way that is not necessarily remembered very well today, but is quite important for the Civil War context. It was framed as a threat to the Confederate States that their continued resistance would be dealt with through emancipation. Um, remember, it's released, it's announced in the fall of 1862. Theoretically, if the Confederacy or components of the Confederacy, if whole states had surrendered in the fall of 1862 or the, or the winter, the Emancipation Proclamation would not have freed anyone, at least in those states, since it was to take effect starting January 1, 1863, and apply only to those regions and states which were still in rebellion and had not yet been conquered and, and liberated, essentially, from the perspective of, of Unionists and, of course, of, of enslaved peoples, um, it's important that we notice that uh, the innovation of uh, an emancipation policy uh, it, it is being focused on the rebellious areas. It is not initially applied to the border states that have remained in the Union, as to say, Kentucky, Missouri, Delaware, Maryland. Uh, slavery remains in effect, and the Emancipation Proclamation doesn't touch it in those Unionist areas. Nor uh, is it clearly uh, something to be in effect where Union armies have a toehold on uh, some Confederate territory in the northern extremity of Virginia, or uh, perhaps some of the hinterland around places like New Orleans, or a few coastal towns on the Atlantic seaboard where there are Union garrisons that have landed early in the war. It's, it's not clear that the Emancipation Proclamation necessarily applies there either. So it's, it's valuable that we notice that emancipation was a war measure. It's also relevant for us to think about innovations involved in the arming of freedmen as soldiers. The very idea of arming former slaves had been a persistent uh, ca a cause of persistent fear throughout the South since the Nat Turner slave uprising of 1831. Arming slaves was indeed at the core of John Brown's 1859 abolitionist plot to seize a federal arsenal of Harper's Ferry and free the South's slaves uh, by force. After John Brown's raid, Southern fears prompted expansion and renewed vitality in the militia. Uh, essentially, the militia of the 19th century was a, like a proto-National Guard is probably the best way to, for us to conceptualize it uh, with ease. Uh, John Brown's raid and its aftermath brought uh, renewed vitality to Southern militia units uh, throughout, throughout the Southern states. And a year later, these independent Southern forces became the core of the first Confederate armies. 
the very idea of a of an African American army struck uh, a lot of people in the South and a few in the North as very unsettling. So there's going to be um, some societal resistance to, to this kind of initiative. Contemporary Northern public opinion rejected the idea of racially integrated units. Even people who were willing to accept the idea of introducing African Americans to the United States Army were not, for the most part, interested in any, a racially integrated uh, Army units uh, popping up. But Republican Massachusetts Governor John Andrew pioneered the establishment of African-American Army units, such as the 54th and 55th Massachusetts Infantry Regiments. Um, since these were the first units established, uh, they were populated by Northern African-Americans from throughout the North including uh, prominently uh, New York and Pennsylvania, large population states, as we've, as we've mentioned before. Uh, so even though these are nominally Massachusetts regiments, um, the personnel in the 54th and 55th uh, uh, Massachusetts Infantry uh, come from uh, many, pla many parts of the North, not just Massachusetts. Ultimately, 175 uh, African-American regiments were raised and administered as the United States Colored Troops, which at, a, at its peak was about 170,000 soldiers uh, and uh, nearly 20% of the Army's, the Union Army's peak strength. So a rather uh, significant component of Union Army strength, especially as we get into the last couple years of the war, as the policy takes hold and numbers in the U.S. CT uh, rise. We'll talk a bit about that in, in, in future lessons. The United States actually paid uh, fairly serious attention to preparing officers for the, the U.S. CT, the U.S. Colored Troops. The vast majority of U.S. CT officers and a significant proportion of the NCOs were European descended and, and very carefully chosen uh, personnel. The reason, uh, unfortunately, was due to contemporary racist ideas, um, which with a historical background, we should be prepared that that, that is what would be uh, evident. Remembering the initial poor performance of hastily recruited militia at Bull Run, and assuming that African Americans were mentally inferior and that their condition of enslavement uh, indicated a, a spiritual and emotional um, lacking as well, that they would not have submitted to slavery if they'd been um, emotionally or spiritually the equals of, of others. Uh, these kinds of assumptions are going to um, impact the, the ways that people think about how African American uh, soldiers should be trained and how to expect them to fight. There's a lot of uh, contemporary expectations and assumptions that are um, deeply ingrained and also are, are pretty important in shaping the employment of US CT personnel. A lot of Northern planners, uh, frankly, worried that US CT soldiers needed disciplined officers or else the regiment might just flee the battlefield and abandon its arms to the, to the enemy, just leave its guns and equipment uh, for the Confederates to capture. Uh, there are some useful questions to consider when thinking about the innovations of emancipation, specifically for the discussion board. I'd like to invite you to, to consider why do national leaders adopt new policies? Next time, in our penultimate, our second last uh, edition, we will explore hard war as a military innovation, and we'll also look at the USCT in combat. I'll see you next time.